Uh, welcome to our live session. I'm Gene Suhir. I'm a Kaplan GMAT teacher. Uh, it's my honor and privilege to be here with you today. Uh, invited by GMAT Club, uh, we've done some sessions uh, recently, a partnership with uh, GMAT Club inviting, uh, inviting Kaplan uh, to make some GMAT concepts that seem at first to be kind of uh, mysterious, uh, to then break them down into bite-sized chunks, make them more palatable. Uh, here we're going to be doing it with combinations and permutations. Um, we did some sessions uh, uh, in fact, uh, I, I led them uh, in the last couple of weeks, one on overlapping sets, another one on probability made easy. And a number of students had requested at the end that, hey, we, we should do one on permutations and, and combinations. So that's what we're going to be doing. Uh, combinations and permutations made easy. Uh, oh, when you can subscribe to this YouTube channel from GMAT Club. If you do so, uh, you get free practice GMAT tests for seven days. So we're going to be looking at combinations and permutations made easy. We're going to break things down. We're going to uh, give you some practice problems, certainly to work on. So kind of built into our uh, uh, learning objective um, is to acquaint you with important uh, principles for arrangements, permutations, and combinations so that after this session is over, uh, you'll be armed with some really powerful tools to help make your practice then in GMAT world moving towards this exam, uh, make it a lot more effective. So let's start out with actually talking about something that's called an arrangement because that essentially is going to serve as like a, uh, like a stepping stone to when we get into permutations afterwards. Let's get right into a sample problem and talk about arrangements. How many ways can five books be arranged on a shelf? Now, we're talking about an arrangement here. Visualize a shelf. If, if I want to be very conscious of my shelf, or a shelf conscious, if you prefer, I can visualize five slots. And I walk up to my shelf with five books under my arm. And when I go to that first position, I have five options for the book that I can put in that first slot. But once I place a book there, now I have four options for the book that will go into the next slot. Once I place a book there, now I'm going to have three options left for the next slot, two for the next, until I get down to the very last slot with only one book left. So that'll have to be the one book that's going to go in that last slot. Now we treat it almost like it's five separate events and find those outcomes separately and then multiply them. Five, four, three, two, and one all multiplied together is 120. Now it looks like Krishnan knows where I'm going with this as we're introducing you or maybe reacquainting with you with it if you've dealt with it in the past, something called factorial. When ancient mathematicians thought about this slots approach, uh, you know, they didn't have the you know, Netflix and the TikTok, uh, so they found this to be very exciting. In fact, so exciting that they decided to denote this idea with an exclamation point. This is not the GMAT shouting at you uh, N. What that exclamation point is, is it is pronounced factorial, is it's basically shorthand for. Take the number in front of the exclamation point and multiply times every positive number smaller than that. So we can also think of this exactly as Krishnan said below, think of this as five factorial. Five times four times three times two times one, 120 possible arrangements. Now, certainly, if I didn't mention before, you want to have for this session, you want to have some scratch paper, perhaps a notebook of some kind handy, uh, but also, right, the recording is going to be available to you, and you can certainly feel free uh, to take screenshots throughout. So let's then, without further ado, move to giving you a little bit of practice with this concept. This one, a little bit of a twist, but Give you exactly the same problem that we just worked through moments ago. So a little bit of a twist here. See if you can identify the twist and then act accordingly. We'll give you about, let's say, 90 seconds or so to try out this problem. I'll uh, pause my camera and, well, stop my camera and, uh, and mute it uh, while you're working on it, and then we'll review. When you have your answer, feel free to put it in the comments down below. Go to it.
All right, so it looks like we have a, a few different answers being given in the comments. Looks like we got some Bs in there. Looks like we got a few Ds in there as well. The right answer here is D. Now, if you got it right, fantastic. We're going to reinforce some best practices. If you missed this one, equally fantastic. The number one best way for you to improve your performance in GMAT world is always to get burned on things and then learn from your mistakes. The nuance here is instead of it being just one set of entities that has to be arranged, here we have two. We've got the students and we've got the teachers. So it's almost like we have to deal with them separately. Let's consider the six students. Now you're going to have these eight positions, but the six students will have to uh, be associated with the six in the middle. The six students can be arranged in six factorial ways. Can imagine certainly the slots, six, five, four, three, two, until you get to the last student spot would have to be that last student. Now multiplying those together, you should have gotten 720, which would have been answer choice B. The test makers for the GMAT, they're notorious for designing trap answers that are the right answer to the wrong question. If all we were doing was arranging the students, answer choice B would have been right. But a uh, plot twist, we've also got the two teachers. Teachers G and H, they have to be in the front end and in the back end of those students. Now, that means that for the two teachers, they can be arranged in two factorial ways. Could be either teacher G or H that would be in the front of the line and then once you place a teacher there, now there's going to be one teacher, the only one left, that would have to be in the back of the line. So that's two factorial ways. Now when we multiply those together, 720 times two, and that is 1440 is answer choice D. Now, if you missed that one, that's certainly okay, right? It's always the student who's able to say, all right, they got me on this one, those, those scams. But here's what I could do a little bit differently next time so they don't get me. I mean, that's that's the student I think every GMAT teacher really bets on when test day comes. Uh, plus, if you miss, they have plenty of chances to redeem yourself. So we have this concept of arrangements where it's very closely related to permutations that we'll get into in a little bit, which is why it's important to first get comfortable with this idea then of arrangements. So let's throw in another little nuance. In this problem, you had these six distinct students distinguishable from one another, two teachers distinguishable from one another. So how do you deal with arrangements where you have lookalike items that are not distinct? How many distinct arrangements can be made from the letters AAA, BBB, CC? Now we're gonna talk about how to handle this little twist. And this is the kind of thing, and I, I say this as a former Kaplan GMAT student myself, this is the kind of thing that once you do a few problems with this little twist, uh, you, you'll really start to feel like you've been doing it your whole life. There's eight letters. If they were all distinct, like let's say A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, we would have just done eight factorial and you know call it a day, but they're not all distinct. We could have, well, let me bring up a little example. Let's say you had an arrangement where, and, and I'm just color coding this for emphasis, Let's say you had an arrangement where the A's were first, third, and fifth. Now, if the A's are first, third, and fifth, that would really be the same positions as if the A's were third, fifth, and first, or fifth, first, and third. We, we don't want to double, triple, quadruple count those if they really are lookalike items in those positions. So what do we do? Let me share with you a little GMAT secret. I, I wasn't sure if I wanted to share GMAT secrets with you all today, but what the heck, you seem like nice people, why not? What we do then is we're going to divide out all the different possible arrangements. Looks like a few of you below here, looks like um, McCool, Naved, know where I'm going with this. Divide the number of possible arrangements, divide out the number of possible arrangements for each type of entity. For any given order, the A's can be placed in three factorial different ways. For any given order, the B's, there are three of those, can be arranged in three factorial different ways. And there are two C's, so for any given arrangement, they can be arranged in two factorial different ways. So what we do then is we follow this model. You start by just treating them like they're all distinct entities, in this case, eight factorial. But then you divide out the number of possible arrangements for each type of entity. The way that would look here is our eight factorial, then divide out three factorial, three factorial, two factorial, just as McCool and Naved, and Naved said down below. Now, I'm going to write out 
the whole next step for the first couple of problems in this lesson, just for the sake of being thorough. But really, as you practice enough with this, and we'll kind of uh, uh, streamline it with a few problems later on in the lesson, you could really kind of combine the next couple of steps. A factorial would be eight, seven, six, five, four, you know, down to one. Three factorial, that's three, two, one. Three factorial is three, two, one, and two factorial is two times one. Now you might think, wait a second, Gene, I, I, I don't get to use a calculator in GMAT quant. So how am I expected to multiply all those? You're not. There's always gonna be stuff that cancels out, I promise. You look for the longest string of numbers that appears in the top and on the bottom and cancel them out. For example, here could start with three, two, one. Also, we also have a three times two times one on the bottom, which would be the same thing as a six on top. There's always stuff that cancels out. And then, well, there's more. We could reduce the four and the two, let's say, down to two and one. A lot smaller, more manageable numbers to deal with then. Two times five is 10, times seven is 70, times eight, and that's going to be then 560. So the idea here is you start with the way you normally would for regular old arrangements and factorial, but then divide out the number of possible arrangements for every type of entity. So how about giving the opportunity then to practice with one of these? Here's the second in format G, uh, GMAT style problem here of this hour. Uh, let's give you about 90 seconds or so. Try your hand at this one. See how you fare. Good luck. Yeah, please put your answers down below in the comments when you have your answer. Oh, uh, Yaswant asks, how long can this session go? So we're scheduled for an hour, although our friends at GMAT Club tell me we can go a little bit longer. Uh, we do have a lot of material we're talking about, right? Starting out with some fundamentals and throwing in some twists and turns. Uh, so we'll probably go about an hour, maybe uh, slightly longer than that. Although, uh, honestly, we could probably spend like six hours uh, looking at some of the ins and outs and what have you. I, I, Think it would hate me by the end of it, it would start getting a little redundant. But what we want to do here is at least, you know, plant the seeds. Uh, so it looks like we've got a C, B, bunch of C's and A down below. The right answer is C. If you got this one wrong, you're about to get a very good chance to retrace your steps, stage a intervention with yourself. The serial mistake was get them next time. We, we always see progress, not perfection in your march towards this exam, whether you're taking it in person or online. We have alfalfa. Now, if at first we just dealt with it like it was uh, seven distinct uh, letters, like A, B, C, D, E, F, G, we would start then with seven factorial, which that's, not, that's what we saw with regular arrangements at the very beginning. But now we have to divide out the number of possible arrangements for each type of entity. There are three A's. So in any given arrangement, they can be arranged in three factorial ways. We also have two Fs. They can be arranged in two factorial ways in any given arrangement. And we also have then uh, two Ls. They have two factorial possible arrangements for any arrangement for all of those letters. So again, for the first couple of problems in this lesson, um, I'm gonna write out the next step, but 
as we get deeper into it, we're going to streamline things and combine a couple of steps. Seven factorial, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Then on the bottom, three factorial, that's three, two, one, two factorial, two times one, and another two factorial, two times one. There's always going to be stuff that cancels out. So we look for what strings on top and on the bottom can we then cancel out? Well, we have three, two, one on the top and on the bottom. We also have on the bottom, the denominator two times one times two times one, which is four, cancels out with the four on top. And side note, um, if you can shave off a little time here and there, you don't even really have to write the ones in either the numerator or the denominator. I mean, anything times one is itself. So you don't really even have to write out the ones. What do we have left standing? Seven, six, and five. Six times five is 30, times seven is 210. Here answer choice C. If you struggled with it, please do not conflate struggling with failing. They're very, very different things. And so if you missed it, hope you got a few good uh, you know, takeaways here to, uh, to take away. Now, Jaskaran asks, what's the question weightage of permutations and probability in the GMAT exam? So those of you that were with us a few weeks ago when we did a uh, session, uh, Kaplan being invited by GMAT club a few weeks ago on, um, uh, on probability, uh, we talked about this a little bit then, and I would say permutations and combinations and arrangements fall under the same umbrella in the sense that it's an adaptive test, right? So the more questions you get right, the harder and harder the questions are that the GMAT starts to throw at you. Well, arrangements, combinations, permutations, and probability, they tend to show up more in higher difficulty problems. So in the pools of questions that the GMAT pulls from, you'll see more questions of this kind, combinations, permutations, arrangements, and probability in higher difficulty pools. So I can't give you an exact number, Jaskaran, for exactly how many uh, arrangement, combination, or permutation problems you'll see on the quant section of your exam. But basically, the higher you're looking to score, the more you should care about them. Uh, because like, if you're getting 500 level problems, yeah, these concepts are like, practically non-existent. Once you get into like 600, 650, or at 700, yeah, yeah, for sure. So I hope that helps, Josh Brown, though I can't give you an exact number for how many you're going to see, but the probability of seeing more of them goes up as your score then moves up. Now, what we just dealt with here with arrangements is essentially a stepping stone to start getting good at permutations. Now, what is a permutation? Well, that's when you have a bunch of people or dogs, or cats, or kitchen appliances, what have you. And out of a larger group, you're selecting a smaller subset, and the order matters. If I said to you, here are 10 movies to pick from. Give me your three favorites, but I want them ranked first, second, third. That would be a permutation. Now, when it comes to permutations, we have for you both bad news, although bad news maybe isn't even so bad, uh, bad news and good news. The bad news is, there is a, uh, oh, uh-oh, Pujita says my screen is blurred, is it only with me? I, I, I hope my screen, let, let me know, folks, down in the uh, down in the comments. I hope it, hope it looks okay. I uh, hope it's nothing on, nothing on my end. Um, the bad news is there is a somewhat uh, ugly-looking permutation formula. That's the bad news. The good news is you should really never, ever, ever have to actually use the permutation formula. Because when order matters, then what that means then is you can use what we call a slots approach. It's going to be related to arrangements with a little adjustment. How many arrangements of three books selected from five books total can be made on a shelf? So we're still going to set up the slots like we did with the shelf at the very, very beginning of this hour. Except this time, we only set up three of those slots. One for each of the books that's actually going to get selected. Now, it is an arrangement, so order matters. So when we go to select the first book for that first slot, we have five options to pick from. Once you put a book there, now you have four options for the next slot. And once you put a book there, now you have three options for the next slot. Treat it like it's almost like three separate events. Pick a book, pick a book, pick a book. Find those outcomes separately and then multiply them. This then becomes 60. So this idea here of arrangements, uh, when uh, of permutations rather, it's kind of like we had with arrangements earlier with setting up the slots, but some of the books end up getting used and some don't. So you set up a slot for each of the things that actually get used and then work one slot at a time. 
So this is kind of taking arrangements to the next level with making a subset. So here's a practice problem right here. Um, I'll give you, let's say, about a minute for this one because I, I, I think, I think once you set up your slots, I, I think you'll find the math itself to actually be fairly minimal. Good luck here. See how you fare. Looks like we have some answers pouring in down in the comments. Nazmo with D, Nicole, Yaswan, Rabish, Nabed with D. I, I think we're starting to get some consensus here. And some of you, it looks like, uh, even got done with it after about uh, 30 seconds or so. Uh, the right answer here in D is answer choice D. Instead of using the permutation formula, which can be done, uh, you know, we're not going to talk about it, though, because you really should never have to use it. Using that slots approach can really make much shorter, easier work out of permutation problems. The thing that tells us here that the order matters is you're giving out a first, second, and third place trophy. So if we had, let's say, Livon first, Naved second, Ravish third, that would not be the same thing as if we had Naved first, Ravish second, Livon third. Order matters. We're going to give out three trophies. When you go to give out the first place trophy, you have 10 finalists available to you. But once you give out that trophy, now you have nine finalists available for second place. Once you give out that trophy, now you have eight finalists available for third. Math itself is actually fairly minimal, typically, when it comes to permutations. A lot of students try and you know, make these things way harder than they really have to be. That's why the title of this session is Permutations and Combinations Made Easy. We'll get into combinations afterwards. Multiply those puppies together. Answer choice D, 720. Now, it's one thing. To simply memorize, right, okay, I set up slots. It's another thing to do enough practice with this, right? Try and get your hands on as many practice GMAT problems as you can, because sometimes they're going to be kind of little twists and turns. Here's such a little twist right here. We'll give you about 90 seconds or so. See, see if you can identify here what the twist is, and then act accordingly. Have a good time with it. Some answers pouring in here down below, too. Ravish, Kashyap, Yaswant, Naved, Nicole, Nazmul, Ashley with C. I think we're starting to get some consensus here. Yeah, answer choice C, it is. At first, it seems like we've got to set up seven slots here. Gloria has seven mannequins. So at first, it seems like we've got to get set up seven slots. But how many slots do we really have to set up? Not seven. Because Gloria has already gone through and started the job without us and already put one shirt on that first mannequin. So that first mannequin 
already spoken for. Leaves us with six slots, with six mannequins uh, represented by those slots and six shirts left for Gloria to place. Gloria goes to the next mannequin, six shirts available, places a shirt there, five shirts available for the next mannequin, then four, three, two, till we get down to the last mannequin. At that point, Gloria will only have one shirt, will have to be the one shirt for that last mannequin. Treat it like separate events, find those outcomes separately, and then multiply them. Answer choice C. Hey, Gene, the, the last two problems we did were both 720. Is this some uh, some mystical GMAT pattern where the right answer to all permutation problems is 720? Uh, no, no. Would that it were? Now, that's that's just a coincidence. You know, uh, before we get into combinations in a moment, um, sometimes students think, oh, permutations must be harder than combinations because order matters. Nah, nah. Permutations are typically easier in GMAT quant than combinations. You don't have to use a formula at all. It's just use the slots approach. It's a Slots are fun to use. Now, permutation is when the order matters. This is different from combinations. What is a combination, you ask? Well, funny you should ask that question. Well, it's when out of a larger group, you select a smaller subset, and you're trying to find out how many outcomes there are when the order doesn't matter. If I said to you, here are 10 movies to pick from. Give me your three favorites, but in no particular order. That would be a combination. Now, here I also have bad news and good news. Well, maybe I think more good news than bad news. Um, the bad news is there is a somewhat uh, ugly looking combination formula that is going to come in handy certain times, uh, recoil at the horror. Uh, no, I'm, I'm kidding. Um, that's, the, that's the bad news. Uh, the good news is this really is the kind of thing, right? We acquaint you with the combinations formula here in this session. You get some practice with it. It's really going to start feeling like You've been doing this your whole life. Now, what do the N and the K represent? Well, that good question nobody asked. The N represents how many you're picking from that are in the original group. The K represents how many you're actually picking. You can think of this here like out of N, you choose K. And when in doubt, it helps to remember that your N number is always greater than or equal to your K number. Here's a sample problem. And then, of course, we're going to give you a few to practice with, kind of get your hands uh, hands in it, and do a few on your own. How many groups of three books, chosen from five, can be put into a suitcase to take on vacation? Well, I'm not arranging them. I'm not putting them in order. So this would not be a permutation. It would be a combination. If, let's say, my three books were uh, Great Expectations, War and Peace, uh, and Animal Farm, that would really be the same set of books as if I had Animal Farm, great expectations and war and peace, right? Order doesn't matter. So into the combinations formula, we will go. Our N is five, because that's how many books we're picking from. And our K is three, how many books we're actually picking. We plop those into the combination formula. Out of five, we choose three. We have the N factorial up top, that's five factorial. On the bottom, we'll have K factorial, that's three factorial, and then N minus K. 5 minus 3, or 2 factorial. In that numerator, then, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, the denominator, 3, 2, 1 times 2 times 1. Look for the longest string that's going to cancel out, 3, 2, 1, on the top and on the bottom. What we have left standing, 5 times 4 is 20 over 2. That's 10 outcomes, or combinations, for how you can select three books out of five. The order didn't matter. So this was a combination. So how do we make the distinction then between whether we use the combination or permutation? Some GMAT problems are very nice to us, and they actually use the word permutations and combinations. Other problems aren't that nice. I mean, yeah, the test makers want you to get a high score, but they want you to earn it in the process. So we ask ourselves a crucial question, the, the inner monologue of the GMAT champion that you are training to be. If the order within each group matters, that's a permutation. You use the slots approach. If order doesn't matter, combination. You would use then the formula. But that does seem a little bit abstract. So this is where it's a good idea to turn the abstract into the concrete, which I think is an important principle throughout the GMAT anyway. You could see why that idea would be important in business, right? Turn an abstract idea into something more concrete. So here's the trick. Come closer. Don't worry. We'll, we'll still be social distancing. Give names 
actual names to a subgroup. Say the order in your mind in a few different ways. See if it makes a different outcome based on what the question's asking. For example, let's say that we were holding an election in a certain office and there are 10 employees that are vying to serve on a certain committee, the committee to do something important. And we're going to elect two of those members. Let's decide if that's a combination or permutation by giving names to the committee members. If my committee members are Nazmul and Ashley, as opposed to Ashley and Nazmul, are those different committees or, or is it the same thing? Uh, Ashley and Nazmul, Nazmul and Ashley, it's the same committee. The order in which I said the names didn't matter, so that would be a combination. We'd use the formula with N10 and K2. Now, let's change one thing. What if we're still going to hold an election and we're still going to have 10 people available to pick from, let's say 10 members of a club, and we're still going to elect two, but this time, instead of it being a committee, we're going to elect a president and vice president. Now, again, let's give names, change the order, see if it makes a different outcome. If we had President Nazmo, Vice President Ashley, as opposed to President Ashley, Vice President Nazmo, it's not the same outcome. Those are different outcomes. So this would then be a permutation. Then we would use then the slots. 10 options for the first slot, nine options for the second, and then we'd multiply them. How about here? Planning a road trip, deciding which three friends to invite to come with you. Let's give them names, change the order, see if it makes a different outcome. If my three friends are Levan, Ravish, and Kashyap, as opposed to Kashyap, Levan, and Ravish, it's the same friends that are coming with me. The, the order in which I said their names didn't make a difference, that's a combination. But what if we're going to go on a road trip and decide who will drive for each portion of the trip? Who will be first, second, third? Well, if it's Levan first, Ravish second, uh, Kashyap third, that's not the same way for driving each portion of the trip as if it was uh, Ravish second, Kashyap, uh, Ravish first, Kashyap second, Levan third. So there the order matters. That's going to be a permutation. So that's really the trick is if you're not sure if it's a combination, you know, order doesn't matter and you use the formula. Or if it's a permutation and order does matter and use the slots, that's it. That's the trick. Give names, actual names to a subgroup. Say their names in your mind in a few different orders. See if it makes a different outcome based on what the question's asking. You'll have to make that decision when you're dealing with combinations or permutations. Well, here's a practice problem. Let's say we'll do well, let's say two minutes. I'd rather maybe err on the side of maybe too much time than not enough time. When you have your final answer, please share down in the comments below. And then we're going to review uh, Eye of the Tiger. Good luck.
you had a hard time with it, don't sweat it, don't throw things, right? You're learning, there's why we talk about these things, right? That's why we have these sessions uh, with Kaplan together with GMAT Club. That's why we have a whole Kaplan course, of course, on the GMAT, right? Any GMAT concept, right? Like building any skills, right? Learning how to ice skate, right? You fall on your face from time to time, and little by little, right? You start to get the hang of it. So we have a few different answers given. The right answer here is B. Now, more importantly, let's talk about how we get there. I don't want you to care just about this problem, but the underlying methodologies, thought processes that you'll be replicating. Certainly after you leave here, if you missed it, learning opportunity time, like, like Jane Austen says, in love and friendship in one's plight is one's opportunity. Pizza restaurant has 10 different pizza toppings. Gita wants to order a pizza with four toppings. How many different ways can she choose her toppings? Let's give the toppings names, change the order, and see if it matters or not. If Gita orders a pizza with, uh, let's say, uh, peppers, mushrooms, olives, and, oh, let's say, uh, chicken, if we had them in a different order, it's, it's still the same set. So the order of toppings on our pizza doesn't matter. So there's not an arrangement of those four toppings. This would be a combination. So since it's a combination, we'll use our combination formula. And is how many we're picking from. Pizza restaurant has 10 different pizza toppings to pick from. And the K, how many Gita is actually picking? Gita is going to select four. So our N will be 10 and our K will be four. Out of 10, we choose four. Our N factorial upstairs will be 10 factorial. On the bottom, K factorial, that would be four factorial. And then N minus K, that's 10 minus four or six factorial. Now, here's where we could really start combining steps. Instead of actually writing out all the numbers on top and on the bottom, you can anticipate what's the longest string of numbers that will appear in both the numerator and the denominator. And you can maybe do a little like a preemptive canceling out. If we actually did write out all the numbers in the top and on the bottom, we would have six factorial, six, five, four, three, two, one in common on the top and on the bottom. So maybe we won't even write that out all the way. We'll have 10, 9, 8, 7, 6 factorial, and then on the bottom, 4, 3, 2, 1, 6 factorial. Do a little preemptive canceling out and not even have to write the 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Now we see what else we can cancel out. There's always stuff that cancels out with the combination formula, I promise. So you don't have to worry about, you know, oh, I don't get to use a calculator in GMAT quant, integrated reasoning, of course, different story. There's always going to be stuff that cancels out. So, okay, there's more. How about the 4 times 2? on the bottom, same thing as eight. Not, not the only way that you could have reduced, but certainly an excellent way to knock out a few of those numbers in one, uh, one fell swoop. We can also reduce the nine and three down to three and one. Multiplying along the top, 10 times three is 30 times seven to 10 is answer choice B. Now, if you treated this like it was a permutation, like order actually mattered, you got a totally different answer, as it looked like a few of you did. Down in the comments, you would have 10 times 9 times 8 times 7. This, again, is where it's a good idea to give names to a subgroup. The GMAT's not always going to use the word combinations and permutations. Uh, it's a good idea to give names to a subgroup. Change the order uh, in your mind a few different ways. See if it makes for a different outcome. Now, uh, it, and of course, if you missed this one, right, hope you got a few good takeaways. Fall forward. As the saying goes, uh, also, if you finish this problem way early and didn't end up with answer choice B, slow down a little, huh? There's no extra points to be gotten in GMAT quants by just getting to a wrong answer more quickly. Now, I know at this point, you might be thinking, hey, Gene, we're already deep into this session and we haven't even done a data sufficiency problem. What's up with that, right? This is an outrage. We won't let this injustice stand. We are going to do a data sufficiency problem in a moment. But the reason we haven't yet is because most of the time, the way combinations, permutations, arrangements are going to show up in GMAT quant, most of the time is going to be in problem solving, most of the time with word problems, but sometimes it does come up in data sufficiency, where we at Kaplan refer to the five answers as 1, 2, T, E, N, kind of the shorthand, uh, though you could also call them A, B, C, D, and E. In this one, too, when we give you two minutes here to try it out, again, decide if it's combination or permutation, and of course, like with any data sufficiency problem, you got to set the standard for sufficiency before you launch into those statements. So hang in there. Eye of the tiger, when you have your final answer, please share in the comments down below.
Got some answers coming in down below. Um, I noticed uh, Ravish asked, sorry, Ravish, I just noticed it now, uh, about that last problem with the pizza that you used the uh, slot method. Yeah, what you missed is that that last one with the pizza wasn't a permutation because order didn't matter. Remember, if you give names, if the four toppings are olive, mushrooms, peppers, and chicken, as opposed to say mushrooms, chicken, pepper, and olives, same set of toppings, order doesn't matter. So it looks like Ravish, you treated it like a permutation when really it was a combination. Hope that helps. And that last one, Apollo asked, was it a 700 plus level problem? No, the last one would be like in the high 600s, maybe like a 670, 680 level problem perhaps. Uh, this one also maybe about a 690 level problem. Not that the math itself is super involved. Um, when you approach it from the right standpoint, a problem like this will become maybe not totally easy, right? Let's not get crazy, but a heck of a lot more manageable even for a high difficulty problem. The right answer here for question six is that each of the statements is sufficient. What a uh, number of you put, right? G, D, Arjun, put in D, right? The fourth answer. Let's set our standard for sufficiency. A group of children enters a room with five identical chairs. Notice we don't know how many children there are originally. Each child rushes to sit in one chair. Assume, so all the chairs are gonna be taken. Assuming each chair can only be claimed by one child, it can have three kids sitting in one chair. How many different groups of children can claim the five available chairs? Now, the group, A, B, C, D, E versus D, B, C, A, E, give names. It's the same group. Order doesn't matter. This would be a combination. Order doesn't matter. So our N, we don't know. That's what we need. That's our standard for sufficiency. The K we know, because we know five kids are going to be selected, out of the whole group of N. Statement number one, after the chairs are claimed, two children will not have chairs. Five children in chairs, two without, that's a total of seven kids. We have our N, N is seven, sufficient. Now we can knock out a few answers, our second, third, and fifth answers. Two T and N, as we call it Kaplan for the shorthand, could also call it B, C, and E, more than a, you know, one way to peel a potato. Now, what about statement number two? If there were two more children, well, if there were two more children, then our new N would be N plus two. And then we would have on the bottom our K factorial, that's five factorial, and then our new N minus K, that's N plus two minus five factorial, equals 126. We have one distinct equation, one variable. We'll be able to find N. Statement number two, also sufficient. Should we actually do the math there in statement two? No, absolutely not. You don't want to go down that rabbit hole. Uh, the cardinal sin of GMAT quant anyway, but especially in data sufficiency is uh, over solving. Just knowing that we can find N, that's enough to say that statement is sufficient. Uh, now, certainly if uh, you struggled with it, right? Hope you got a few good takeaways. Uh, chalk it up to experience, right? Oscar Wilde said experience is just the name that we give to our mistakes. So the key here, right, really for a lot of these, right, is determine whether it's permutation or combination, whether order matters, permutation, slots, or order doesn't matter, combinations, formula. Sometimes though, in certain problems, you're going to have a few different groups with a few different subsets. Here you're going to have Jolanda having to buy balls out of a larger group and board games out of a larger group how many different selections of the five items can Jolanda make? Now, let's give you a couple minutes to try this one out too. Here's, here's a hint. Deal with the ball separately, deal with the board games separately. And then think about at the end what you're going to do with those results. All right, I, I will say no more unless they give anything away. Good luck.
Um, I'd like to mention, by the way, we're going to try and save a little bit of extra time at the end here. We're probably going to go a little bit uh, over an hour. GMAC Club has given us uh, permission to do that so we can kind of get into more twists, like certainly with this one. Uh, but also this video will be available and you can, uh, if any questions pop up or comments pop up uh, at some later date when you check out this video, maybe for some review, uh, one of us either from Kaplan or GMAC Club is going to be monitoring, the, uh, monitoring those comments. And I wouldn't expect you after this session to immediately feel like a total pro with this stuff. Oh, I'll go take the GMAT tomorrow. It doesn't work that way, unfortunately. But built into our, our learning objective is to basically kind of give you the blueprints to follow. It's the practice problems that you do after this session where you really uh, build the house to stick with that analogy. So let's see what we got. It looks like we've got uh, quite a few E's that are coming up here. Uh, oh, and Ravish, in that previous question, if it wasn't data sufficiency, no, there couldn't be more than one value of n possible, because the bigger and bigger n gets, the bigger your result would get out the other end. But we needed it to be 126. So no, there was only one possible value for n. And by the way, Ravish, uh, since you're asking, in that previous problem, if we did actually have to solve for n, I would say that would be a good time to uh, back solve, plug in numbers from the answers, or just pick number to turn the abstract into the concrete. Luckily, it was data sufficiency, so we didn't have to solve. So let's see, our answer here, yeah, got some E's below. Yep, E is an excellent, that's the right one. If you missed it, learning opportunity time, you make like the postage stamp, you stick to something until you reach your destination. We have Jolanda, who goes to the toy store, have to select, has to select five items. But we can't have Jolanda just running around the toy store grabbing whatever five items she wants all willy-nilly. We need something specific to happen with balls and something specific to happen with board games. There are two balls out of the four. If she has ball A and B versus B and A, same set of balls, same selection. Jolanda's not arranging them. So it'd be a combination where our N4 and our K2, four factorial over two factorial times four minus two, or two factorial, the longest string of numbers that will appear on the top and on the bottom, will be two factorial. We can do a little preemptive canceling out and just have four times three is 12 over two, that's six outcomes for balls. What about for board games? Jolanda's going to select three board games out of five. Give names. If Jolanda leaves with checkers, chess, and monopoly, as opposed to monopoly, checkers, and chess, same set of board games. She's not arranging them. She's not putting them in order. Another combination. Here, out of five, we choose three. So five factorial over three factorial times five minus three or two factorial. The longest string here that will appear in the top and the bottom is three factorial. Do a little preemptive canceling out. That's five times four is 20 over two, 10 outcomes for board games. When you're looking to find the number of outcomes for one event and another, we dealt with this with probability a little bit a few weeks ago in a, a previous session. You find their outcomes separately and then multiply those puppies. Six times 10 is 60. That's because Jolanda can leave the store with ball combination A and any of the 10 outcomes for board games, ball combination B with any of the 10 combinations for board games and so on. So it would be 10, 10, 10, 10, you know, six times or six times 10. So we had to make the decision here. It was combinations. We just had to do it two separate times, two separate selections that Jolanda was making. Let's go over to another data sufficiency problem. Now, this one, by the way, this one would be about a 700, 710 level problem. Doesn't mean the math is going to be super involved. This isn't a straight up math test. Oh, yeah, I mean, the GMAT does presuppose a certain level of math proficient, proficiency, sure. It's a strategy-based test that uses math as a tool to test you on your critical thinking skills, your creative problem-solving ability. So uh, critical think away right here. Try this one on for size, see how it fits.
notice the language here about how many ways could they be displayed in a row, that tells us that the order is going to matter. It's not going to be here a combination. So we have a, a number of answers down below. The right answer here is T for together, that individually the statements were insufficient, but collectively they are sufficient. If you missed it, mistakes are the portals to discovery, a uh, hashtag James Joyce. Now, a little twist here that makes it a higher difficulty problem is that all the coins are going to be displayed. So it's not that out of a larger group, we're selecting a smaller subset and order matters. That would be permutation. It's all of the coins are going to be used and order matters. This brings us back to what we looked at at the very beginning of the session. This would be an arrangement. So what we have to know is how many gold and silver coins there would be. If we know the number of gold and the number of silver, then the statement would be sufficient. Now, statement number one by itself tells us the number of gold and the number of silver coins are equal to each other. Well, if there was, let's say, two gold and two silver, that would certainly give us a much smaller answer than if, say, we're 10 gold and 10 silver. Statement one, insufficient. And so that means a few answers then we would hardly be able to eliminate. Now, what about statement number two by itself? Well, statement number two by itself tells us if only the silver coins were displayed, 5,040 different arrangements, let's say S for silver factorial, would be possible. Now, from statement number two, we can find the number of silver coins, but that doesn't give us the gold. Now, if you're wondering, wait a second, Gene, from statement two, though, if we could find the number of silver, of course, we shouldn't do it. Doesn't that mean we also know the number of gold? No, because from statement two by itself, that doesn't tell us that gold and silver will be equal numbers. Take, for example, if you had uh, uh, an arrangement that started with gold and ended with silver. Yeah, there would be equal numbers. But what if it started with gold and ended with gold? Like gold, silver, gold, silver, gold. There would be one more gold and silver. Or what if it started with silver and ended with silver? silver, gold, silver, gold, silver. There would be one more silver than gold. So statement two doesn't tell us how many uh, gold coins there would be. It'll either be equal to the number of silver or one more or one less than the number of silver. Also insufficient. So we had already eliminated the first and fourth answers from statement number one. From statement number two, we could also now say, okay, we're gonna have to combine taken together We'd know the number of silver from statement two. Combining it with statement one, we'd also know the number of gold. If we know each of the actual numbers, silver and gold, we know then how many total arrangements there would be. So T then for together, or C, if you want to call it that, the, the third answer. A little bit tricky there, right? That's why I have to give a little thought here, not just to combination, permutation, or arrangement, but also how could the arrangement go? Remember, it could start with gold and end with silver could start with gold, end with gold, could start with silver and end with silver. They just have to alternate here. So, and notice by the way, they tell us each of the coins then is distinct. So we don't have to deal with the uh, the repeaters, the lookalike items. All right, let's 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 try and slip in one more, uh, uh, one more question. Oh no, 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 this would be about a 700 level question, Shailen, uh, mainly because, now if it didn't feel that hard to you, beautiful. It means you're, you're thinking about exactly in the manner that the GMI wants to reward you for. This would actually be about a 700 level problem, Shailen, most of, mostly because a lot of students don't give that extra thought in statement number two of, oh, it could be equal numbers of gold and silver or one more gold or one more silver, even though, yeah, the math itself, certainly fairly minimal. All right, let's try and slip in one more and then we'll uh, have some takeaways and leave some time open for the uh, time open for the uh, the Q&A then afterwards. So let's say you've got 90 seconds, two minutes here uh, for this. Y'all have been crushing it all, all session. Why? Why stop now? Rock and roll.
looks like B is very popular here. Nosmol down to uh, Prabhakar King Lear. I love the name. Uh, looks like B is very popular here. B it is. The uh, nuance here is that they don't tell us exactly directly. They didn't, don't tell us how many teams are going to be selected. But if they play each other, any given game is going to have two teams. Now, if it's the Lions and Tigers, as opposed to Tigers and Lions, it would be the same game, Lions versus Tigers, Tigers versus Lions. So it would be a combination. Here, we are going to have eight teams to pick from. And for any game, two that we are actually going to be picking. Combination. Eight factorial uh, uh, on top, that's N factorial. On the bottom, K factorial, that's two factorial. And then eight minus two or six factorial. We can do a little preemptive canceling out. There will be a six, five, four, three, two, one on the top and on the bottom. So we don't even have to write them. Just have the eight times seven on top and two times one or two on the bottom. Then the eight and the two, we could reduce four and one. This is 28. Oh, it's a good feeling, right? You have an answer that shows up in the answer choices. Uh, if that's not the answer that you got, uh, you know, I, I will quote the great philosopher Chumba one, but you get knocked down you will get up again. So before we open things up for some Q&A afterwards, um, here are really the, the headlines, the, the big takeaways that we want you to take away from this session. If all of the items are being used and you're ordering them, that's an arrangement. The number of possible arrangements of n items is n factorial. If you're arranging items that include lookalike entities like we had with alfalfa earlier in this hour, you start by treating it like just n factorial but then you divide out the number of arrangements for each type of entity. If you have a permutation, out of a larger group, you're selecting a smaller subset, and order matters, that's a permutation, you use the slots. If the order doesn't matter, you then use the formula. And your N would be how many you're picking from, K would be how many you're picking. And I think this is one of the most important takeaways uh, to know which approach to use, because if you're not using the right approach, it doesn't matter what math you do. You get a wrong answer. Wouldn't that be a fine kettle of fish? Give names, actual names to a subgroup. Change their order. Say in a few different ways in your mind. See if it makes a difference. And here's a, 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 little, a little fun fact, by the way. If you have a locker and you have a certain code, right, you need to access the locker. What most people call a combination lock is really a permutation lock. Like, let's say to get into that locker, you're supposed to put in 10, 20, 30, right, to gain access to the locker. If you put in 20, 30, 10, you're not going to get in. You're not going to get into that lock. So what most people call a combination lock is really a permutation lock. Oh, and I noticed with that, that last problem there, uh, Shaylin, yeah, the numbers there, Shaylin, were small enough. Yeah, you could totally totally get away with that. Uh, do, oh, team A plays the other seven teams. That's seven outcomes. Team A is out. Team B plays the other six teams. So that's six outcomes. Team B is out and so on. And you could do that all the way down until you get to the last two teams. Yeah, the, the numbers were certainly uh, small enough where you could totally get away with that, Shaylin. If the numbers are bigger, yeah, you wouldn't have been able to, to get away with that then. But yeah, that's certainly another, another approach you could certainly use. Well, thank you all very much for your hard work with, uh, throughout this session. Uh, we hope that we've made combinations, permutations, and arrangements a little bit more uh, more palatable. Uh, maybe not always easy, but certainly a lot more manageable to give you the right the right mindset to attack them. I, I use that proactive verb attack quite deliberately, right? We want you to take control of this exam. Um, if you have any questions or comments or concerns, now's a good time uh, to bring them up. I'll try and address how many of them I can uh, in the comments down below. Of course, the video will also be available to you, uh, uh, but, uh, I, I guess in perpetuity, uh, here on GMAT Club's YouTube channel. Make sure you subscribe if you haven't already. You'll get access to uh, uh, GMAT practice tests for seven days. Oh, and check out some of Kaplan's free read. I mean, I'd love to see you in one of the Kaplan courses that I teach for sure. Uh, but also check out some of Kaplan's free resources for the GMAT. There's Kaplan free practice tests, question of the day, 20-minute uh, workout. But basically, learning science tells us that to really build mastery, once you have a solid foundation on like the, the theory, right, the nuts and bolts, true mastery is really going to come from like doing and reviewing, doing and reviewing, doing and reviewing. So get your hands on as many practice problems as you absolutely can. Uh, to little by little, right, you really start to, uh, you know, uh, reduce the house advantage 
that the test makers have and and build an advantage over your competition that's out there too so all right let, let's let's open it up any questions comments concerns so on and so on i had some fun with you in this session in our live session here i uh i hope you learned some good stuff certainly in the process too questions comments concerns thank you all for thank you all for coming of course if you are if you are leaving please have a beautiful rest of your monday please stay safe it's a good good time for everybody to stay home and work on some gmat problems right you're welcome monica i hope it helped onward and upward great work in here shaylin great work onward and upward with some of our live sessions it would it, it would worry me a little bit if we didn't have too many questions at the end but this group it, it, they're on the ball what are you guys trying to get high GMAT scores or something? Are you trying to go to business school or something? If you're not careful, you'll do just that. So if we do another session, maybe we can do another session, Ravish. Uh, you know, we can talk to our uh, friends at GMAT Club. Maybe we can do another session with combining uh, probability with combinations and permutations. Like, let's say, for example, um, you know, take the one that we did with, uh, oh, let's say this one, right? Um, oh, if we had those 28 games, by the way, and we wanted to know, let's say, how many orders there could be for them, it would be 28 factorial. 28 games could go first, once a game is played, 27 games next, and the GMAT would never expect it to calculate 28 factorial. It, it would just be in the answer choices. Uh, but let's say here we could combine it with probability, right? There's 28 games, uh, and uh, let's say they wanted, uh, what's the probability that the Lions, that you pick a game that the Lions... Are playing in one of those games well i figure the lions are going to play against these seven other teams so that's seven games and that would be your desired right out of the uh then total outcomes you can totally uh combine it that way with with probability uh let's see but, but uh we'll ask ravish if we can get our our friends at gmac club get together with uh our people at kaplan if we can partner up for another one of these sessions we've done a few uh together in the last few weeks uh overlapping sets if you want to check that one out on the GMAT Club channel, uh, probability made easy. And now this one, combinations and permutations uh, made easier, at least I hope made more manageable. Uh, maybe we can then get together, do one with combining those concepts, certainly. You can even combine them certainly on your own. Um, oh, King Lear, uh, I love your name. Uh, the Jolanda slide again. Yes, let us go back to our friend Jolanda. Bear with me here. It's one thing when I go through the slides in order. Ah, this one, okay. So how would the question stem change if it were a permutation question? Okay. So instead of asking how many different selections of the five items can Jolanda make, if they phrased it differently and said, Jolanda is going to um, buy two different balls out of the four types of balls and arrange them in her playroom, one on the left, one on the right, that would be a permutation three different board games out of the five, and then we do, uh, you know, then uh, we would have uh, slots four times three. If instead of it being three different board games out of the five, and you just have to select a group, if it was, Jolanda's going to select three, three different board games and arrange them on a shelf in her playroom from left to right, or top to bottom, let's say, then it would have been a permutation. Uh, so if, the, if, if you see language like order, arrange, um, uh, rank, that could be a big one, like first, second, third place trophies, um, way, distinct ways to display, um, that kind of, maybe there's like a status thing, like president and vice president, that kind of language would indicate then a, uh, a permutation. So I, I, I hope that helps King Lear, I love your name, I hope that helps King Lear, uh, but that's how it would change for it to be a permutation question that, oh, or let's say we had the same problem but with, with all the combinations, right? But let's say then at the end, it asked us, um, okay, at the end, um, Amanda's gonna put either her uh, group of balls in her left hand and group of board games in her right hand or the other way around, uh, you know, that, that then then order would matter. And then we can take this result uh, uh, at the end and then uh, throw in the, the idea of permutations then afterwards. I hope that, hope that helps King Lear. Uh, bye, Apollo. Bye, Nazmul. Great work in here. Bye, Ashley. 
by Zinte. I hope I'm saying it. I apologize if I'm butchering the pronunciation of your name. Great work in here, Zinte. Great work, Prabhakar. Again, I apologize anybody if I'm if I'm saying your name incorrectly. By Parth, great work in here. Oh, you've attended all of them, Shubham. All of them. I hope you haven't got tired of seeing my bald head on your computer screen then, Shubham. Um, I don't believe, Shailen, that we've included it in any of the previous videos. Our GMAC Club folks can correct me if I'm wrong, uh, but I don't think in any of the uh, the GMAC Club uh, sessions that we've done, uh, led by uh, some of us folks at Kaplan, I don't think we've had uh, cardinality in our sessions on set theory. Uh, I, I, the GMAC Club folks can correct me if I'm wrong, because I haven't gone through all of the uh, GMAC Club videos um, that are available on the YouTube channel. <clears throat> Make sure you subscribe. Uh, but I, but it might be, if, if not, we'll talk to our GMAC Club folks and see if maybe we can make a session perhaps like that. I'm glad that helped King Lear, your majesty. Last call, questions, comments, concerns. Of course, if any comments pop up, right, the video will be available to you, review uh, any portion of it. Let me put those uh, takeaways back up there at the end. Um, any portion of it you can review. And if any questions or concerns do arise, if any questions or concerns do pop up, yeah, put them in the comments below. And uh, one of us from either Kaplan or from GMAC Club is going to be monitoring those and will uh, uh, we'll, we'll respond in a, uh, you know, a, a suitable soon, uh, you know, as soon as possible period of time. Last call, last call. Bye, Shailen, great work in here. Last call, GMATers, GMATites, GMAT enthusiasts, GMATologists, GMATonians, whichever sobriquet you prefer, GMAT gladiators. How's that? In the pizza question. If the order mattered, yes, let us go back to that pizza question. Uh, that was the one with Gita selecting the pizzas, I believe, right, Ravish? Uh, let me go back to that one. Sorry, bear with me. It's one thing when I go through the slides in order. Uh, another thing to uh, go back through them. Yeah, that one with Gita. Ah, this one right here. So, yes. So, if it were a permutation, right, like... Um, um, I mean, a few things in that problem would really have to change. Um, if it were a permutation, what you would have done then is, okay, she has 10 options for what to pick first, picks a topping, nine options for what to pick next, picks a topping, eight for what goes next, picks a topping, seven for what goes next. If it had been permutation, then you, you would do this, you set up four slots, one for each of the toppings that would get selected, and then you would start moving across 10, 9, 8, 7, and then multiply those out together. Um, there is a permutation formula, theoretically, you could use. It's very similar to combination formula, just doesn't have the extra k factorial uh, on the bottom. But uh, really, the slots is just a streamlined, simplified version of the permutation formula. But I, I hope that helps, Ravish. Does that answer your question? That if, if order mattered, although the GMAP probably wouldn't do this uh, with pizza toppings, uh, would you know, have to do it with, with some, maybe they would do it with um, four pizzas come out of the oven one at a time, each one with one topping. How many orders can there be? Okay, then, uh, you know, then something like that, they'd make a permutation problem. And then the same thing, right? 10, 9, 8, 7. But the, the, the coming through line here, of course, Ravish, you always give names uh, to decide combinations versus permutations. Before you launch into the math, uh, what we call at Kaplan, step one of the problem-solving method isn't jump in and do math. It's analyze the question and consider what, what strategy is going to be in play. You give names. Say the names in a few different orders, right? Uh, mushrooms, olives, peppers, chicken, as opposed to peppers, chicken, olive, mushrooms. Same same toppings on that pizza. Uh, so that, that's what tells us order, order, doesn't, order doesn't matter. The wording is a little... Yeah, sometimes... Some, I don't want to get too philosophical with it, Ravish, but you know we're we're using realistic, right, GMAT style problems with GMAT style wording. Um, while the test makers go to great lengths to make sure that things aren't, you know, uh, they may not express themselves in the same way you and I do uh, in conversation. They go to great lengths to make sure that the wordings aren't uh, ambiguous, right? They they don't want any uh, any uh, 
uh, kind of protest. Anybody coming back to them and say, well, they could kind of be interpreted a few different ways. Uh, but sometimes we have to do some like uh, translating from, uh, you know, GMAT into English or from English into English. There's a reason for this, by the way, in business school and in the world of business. Sometimes you're not presented with information in the same way that you would have presented it. And so you have to do like the decoding. See the language, how many different ways can she choose her topics? If it didn't say ways, if it said, Ravish, how many different uh, orders can she choose her toppings? Or how many different arrangements can she choose her toppings would have then been a permutation. But how many different ways can she choose them? Well, there's, you know, when you pick uh, peppers, mushrooms, olives, and chicken, that's the same way of choosing them as, if, you know, you, you go to a pizza place, right? If you tell, uh, uh, you know, tell the, the person behind the counter, tell the waiter, say, oh, I want a pizza with olive, mushrooms, peppers, and chicken. You're going to get exactly the same pizza, served the same way as if you asked for peppers, chicken, mushroom, and olives, right? So, uh, you know, don't let your real life common sense go out the window. It should be used in conjunction with your application of, uh, you know, uh, uh, GMAT skills, uh, certainly. But I, I hope that, maybe that visualization, I hope helps, right? If you, uh, if you tell the uh, waiter or the server at the, uh, uh, at the pizzeria, oh, here's the pizza I want, here are the four toppings, regardless of the order in which you say the names of those four toppings, you're going to get then the, the same pizza that's going to be served to you. This is the, uh, the high calorie portion of the, uh, of the session today. So I hope that helps, Ravish. Um, all right, last call. Any questions, comments, concerns, complaints, observations, objections, anecdotes? GMAT haiku or limerick, perhaps? You got, you got what, I'm, what I'm getting at, Ravish? Smelling the pizza that I'm cooking. And that, if that's the case, you hear that sound? It's the sound of your GMAT score going up. Because now you'll you'll be less likely to be confused in similar problems moving forward. You're welcome, Ravish. Onward and upward. All right. So in that case, I guess we'll uh, we'll wrap things up. Um, in that case, for those of you still uh, hanging about, uh, don't take it personally, but we're going to going to end the session. Uh, certainly. Make sure you get your hands on whatever practice problems you can get to hammer away at this stuff. I would certainly love to see you in one of our Kaplan courses, but uh, whatever you do, right, you, this is an important test, right? You want to give it the attention it deserves. And basically, the, the higher you're scoring, the, the more you should care about things like arrangements, combinations, and permutations. You start to see more of them in those higher difficulty problems. So onward and upward, uh, GMAT soldiers. And uh, I hope to see you all back here with uh, one of our sessions here live. Uh, make sure you subscribe uh, with the GMAT Club very soon. Onward and upward. Good day all.